1950s and 60s were a golden era for many Southsiders. Employment and production were going strong. And although the railroads were in decline, even Buckeye Steel was desperate for workers because of the high turnover. They literally would send buses down uh, into West Virginia and Kentucky to recruit people and bring them up to Columbus. They'd come up, I'd see them, they'd come in the store. Also, they would buy a little furniture, you know what I mean? Because they'd settle here or their kids would settle here. But that changed the whole complexion of the area. It was losing its immigrant complexion because these were Americans who went back to Scots Irish stock and they came up. They weren't, you know, that same type of personality. Well, at one point uh, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, two thirds of the people living in Columbus were first or second generation Appalachian. When people move from the mountains up to Columbus, they, they bring their culture with them. Here's the first number. Don't say goodbye if you love me. And that culture does, of course, include their music. And so I think a lot of the people who migrated up here from uh, Eastern Kentucky and from West Virginia did bring their music with them. John Hickman's father moved to Columbus from Kentucky looking for work. John would find his calling as a musician, and he learned his craft playing banjo in the bluegrass bars and clubs on Parsons that catered to the Appalachians working on the South Side. It was relaxation for them, I think, which meant dancing some if they want to, wanted to, or uh, just sit there and drink beer until they couldn't drink anymore. Parsons Avenue probably had uh, three that I can think of. Well, another one right on Marion Road, um, a couple over here on High Street. At one time, there was probably uh, uh, five down here that, that, that played. It was a mixed crowd. I mean, there was probably people there from Tennessee, uh, Indiana, you know, of course, Kentucky, and uh, a lot of Kentuckians in a while back that time. I have come to tell Sounds like happy, good time, uh, dance music even. Uh, but if you listen to the lyrics then, there's something sad about it. It's as if the music is trying to overcome the sadness of the situation that's being described. You know, up north in an urban environment, this was a way to hold on to uh, home. They, they were bars where the, where the working class people would go. And uh, yeah, so, some of those got pretty rough. Well, as they put it now, it would be a knife and gun club. You know, but uh, it was rough, uh, but that was part of it. Well, the, the Astro Inn, for one thing, had a reputation for being kind of rough. However, I never got in on any of that. And you had to be wary and you had to be cautious and you had to be sure you didn't offend the wrong people. But by and large, the guys who were going to fight were going to fight among themselves, and they were on the other side of the wall. The music was in one half room in, in the, the bar, and the serious serious uh, professional drinkers were on the other side. They left us alone, we left us, them alone, and everybody had a good time. It was a time of growth and affluence, but with that came change. More people owned cars, so they didn't have to live in a neighborhood that was close to where they worked. When people left the area around the Donaldson and Washington corridor, they tended to move east. They moved into uh, the Driving Park area, into Old Oaks. They went down the Livingston Avenue area um, into eventually Berwick and Eastmore and some into Bexley. I know that's what happened to our family. Uh, you know, my father finally returned. We could make some money, we went to live on our own, and so we moved further east. There was already talk of something happening in there, which was eventually the freeway that destroyed the area. They have called it the ditch or the trench you know, that came through, and you can even see, if you just stand on the bridge and look, you can see that houses would have been right there where that uh, 70 went through. It wasn't just the interstate that threatened the neighborhood. Many of the industries that had anchored the neighborhood were in a fight for their lives. Manufacturing moved overseas. Environmental regulations grew. Markets shrank. Seagrave had built fire trucks on High Street since 1900. It was sold and moved out of town. Even Buckeye Steel was in trouble. What happened is railroads uh, went in decline. It's a cyclical market to start with. 
And then they went into sort of long-term decline compared to uh, cars and airplanes. Federal Glass, Kimball Glass, or Owens, Illinois, they're all gone. Then you had American Standard, and it left in the 60s, and it more or less just knocked this. Other than Buckeye Steel, everything was gone. Stores started to close, shopping centers came, and it lost its neighborhood quality. Some things have changed so much as well, like Schottenstein's is gone. That whole area, that whole section's gone. As businesses disappeared, so did jobs. Without work, many people were forced to leave. Neighborhoods that had been stable for generations began to see rental properties, absentee landlords, and abandoned homes. One South Side institution continued to thrive, but there were growing pains around Children's Hospital, now Nationwide Children's Hospital. Essentially, the hospital was expanding. The neighborhood appreciated the fact that Children's Hospital was here and the quality institution that it is, but there was some pushback because in order for progress to happen, many of these older, beautiful homes had to come down. But there was some real animosity. Uh, I think there was thought that we'd take over the park. Uh, we certainly were taking over houses, which they thought that they needed, but yet children's needed the space, and they were some of them were pretty run down. 100 years ago, you could hear, smell, and see the influence of the powerhouse industries here. But that's history. <laughs>